Hey, it's great to see you all in here today. Good morning. Man, I'm delighted to be with you. If you don't know me, I'm Scott, one of the pastors here. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 36. If you need a Bible, do this, and we will get you a copy to follow along. And when you get it, turn to Romans 11, verse 36. One verse. One, well, we're going to look at a lot of verses, but that's the one that we're going to base our text on today. It's the heart and the soul of what I'm going to talk about today, Romans eleven thirty six. How's your march? You having a good month? Yeah? Any madness in your march? Who's watching the tournament? Basketball tournament? Some of you are like, what tournament? Hockey? What, what, what's going on? <laughs> NCAA basketball tournament. How's your bracket doing? How's the, you guys do a bracket for the tournament? Mine looks like a bad term paper. It's just all marked up. Did anybody pick Loyola Chicago to get to the final four? Okay, you know the deal on Lion and Church, right? Here's what I know. March is the season where if, every, if you have watched every second of every basketball game all year long, or if you know Jack Squat about basketball, you stand the same probability of predicting the tournament accurately. All right. Now, I don't know anything about basketball, really. I've never really played basketball. Now, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Pastor Scott, if anybody was built for basketball, it's you. <laughs> but I know this. There's a stance in basketball, right? And it's a stance where you kind of have the ball back here. It's kind of resting on your hip. You got your feet squared. One's a little in front of the other. And you kind of got the ball tucked away like this. This is called what? The triple threat stance. Why do they call it the triple threat stance? Because there's three things that you can do from right here, okay? You got the ball kind of out of the way so it's not going to get stripped or stolen. Three things you can do. You can dribble, you can pass, or you can shoot, right? Now, I know I, I may just be a five foot five former high school wrestler, but I know that if you can dribble and pass and shoot, you can be an effective basketball player. That's the trifecta of basketball, dribble, pass, shoot, the triple effect. That's what trifecta means. Now, I'm not here to tell you about the trifecta of basketball. I want to talk about the trifecta of prayer. And we are going to look in a verse today and discover a divine trifecta, three things that we see throughout Scripture from beginning to end, and it's true in all of life, in the Christian life, and in all of creation, and we're going to look at this trifecta through the lens of prayer. Would you stand with me right now? Romans 11, verse 36. Paul writes, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That's it. That's the text tonight. Now, Scott, what's that got to do with prayer? I'm going to tell you in just a moment, but for right now, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we're all gathered here today, and God, I know, I believe that it's not by accident that anyone is here today. It's by design. It is your purpose that we're here, God, because we know all things are from you. And God, as we interface with one another through your ordained means of worship and the word and through your Holy Spirit, God, we know it is through you that we are connecting today. And God, we do this unto you and unto your glory because all things are to you, God. And may we embrace the truth of your word today and find application for it specifically in the area of connecting with you through prayer in an effective way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. All right. Well, recently I was hanging with my two youngest kids, and we were on the internet, and I was, I was on YouTube, and I'm show, we're watching some videos together, and I was showing them, these are the cartoons that daddy used to watch when I was your age, right? Now, when I was a kid, cartoons were on Saturday morning. None of this 24-7 stuff. You can't just catch them anywhere. It was special. You got up early, you got your Coca Puffs, you sat down, and you watched a show. That was the deal, Right? And, and I enjoyed the cartoons, and then every once in a while, they'd sneak in something educational. Like you thought you were being entertained, but no, they were teaching you something, right? And I remember a program called Schoolhouse Rock, right? Schoolhouse Rock. And they had all these songs on there. I'm just a bill sitting here on Capitol Hill, right? One of the songs was three, 
is the magic number, right? That was my favorite. And it talked about how everything comes in threes. There's always three. There's three of this, there's three of that. Man, that's still true, isn't it? Anytime you want to be successful in something, there's always somebody ready to tell you, here's three things you got to know. Here's three things you want to remember. Here's three things for you to be aware of. And online, you see these ads and they'll pop up. Three steps to managing your money. Three tips to reducing belly fat. Three tips to making your Disneyland vacation awesome, right? Well, if I were to tell you there's three things you need to acknowledge in order to have a more effective prayer life, well, you'd want to know what that is, right? I mean, who doesn't want an effective prayer life? You want answers to prayer? I want answers to prayer. Well, here it is in Romans eleven thirty six, and we have already read this, and we see the first thing that we need to acknowledge in order to have an effective prayer life is this. All things are from him. All things are from him. For from him and through him and to him are all things. And in your notes... Everything in the Christian life, including prayer, begins with God. Everything, we have that on the screen here, everything in the Christian life, including prayer, begins with God. It'll be on the screen in just a second. There it is. Miracles never cease. All right. What does the Bible say? Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. The first four words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. How did we begin? We began with God. We, he is the origin of creation. So this is true in creation, right? God created everything. Atheists and evolutionists, man, they, they, they say that life arose by chance, that it's all mere happenstance, that we're here, right? But did you know there's a scientist by the name of Fred Hoyle, respected researcher? He's the guy that coined the term the Big Bang. You've heard of the Big Bang, so this is, this is a renowned scientist. He said that the probability of life arising by chance is the same as a tornado coming through a junkyard and assembling a 747 from the materials therein. God is the origin of everything. We did not arise by chance. And we're going back to God. We're going back to God, right? Uh, how does the Bible end? It begins in the, in the beginning, God, and in Revelation 1.8, it says, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the, right? The alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, okay? We're all going back to God. We're going to end in God. We began there, and we're going to, what's the world coming to? It's coming back to God. One way or another, it's going to get there. And in between the beginning and the end, he is sustaining us. We are existing through him. In Colossians, it says that in him all things were made, right? For by him all things were created. In verse 17, it says he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Did you know that Jesus Christ is the reason that the world does not fly apart, that our molecules stay in one spot? He sustains us. It is through him. So this notion of being from him and through him and to him is true physically, isn't it? It's also true spiritually. Did you know that? You're, you're, if you're a believer, you were saved. Your salvation did not originate with you. It originated with God. He called you by his spirit and he brought you to that place of understanding who he is. And when you were born again, you put your faith in him and through him, through his shed blood on the cross, you were redeemed. And now you are growing and you are being sanctified through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's all to the glory of God. And one day you will return to him. You are from him and through him and to him. So this trifecta is true physically. It's true spiritually. It's true practically. In the practices that we have in our church. We took an offering this morning, didn't we? We take an offering every service, right? Right? And what do we say? We're thankful. We're grateful for you, for your generosity. And we want to remind you, you're not just given to a church. You're given to God. But I want to say, in the most truthful sense, you're actually not giving of your own to God. Did you know that? What does the Bible say? In, uh, in 1 Chronicles, it says... For all things come from you, 1 Chronicles 29, 14, and of your own we have given you. What you have to give to God is already his. He gave it to you. And through his spirit you are prompted, you are motivated to give back to God. And it goes to him. It is from him, it is through him, and it is 
to him. It's like C.S. Lewis who shares that story of the little child, comes to her father, says, Daddy, can I have some money? He gives her money. She goes, she buys him a present, and she brings it to him. Daddy, I bought you a present. Well, he bought his own present, didn't he? God works that way as we give. So this concept is true in all areas of life. It's from him, it's through him, and it's to him. Now let's look at it through the lens of prayer. Here, in this beautiful divine cycle, is the origin of prayer. In your notes, effective prayer is anchored in his purpose. It's rooted, it is anchored in the purpose of God. Listen, the prayer that gets to heaven starts in heaven. Okay? The prayer that gets to heaven starts in heaven. What do I mean by that? Well, in order to understand that, we got to clear up some misconceptions about prayer because there's, a, there's some things out there. We need to make some clarifications. Now, I've got a few things I want you to write down. I didn't put them in your notes, so if you want, jot these down. I think they're worth remembering. First of all, and we'll have them on the screen here. First, prayer is not man's method for imposing his will in heaven. It's God's chosen method for accomplishing his will on earth. Okay? This is not about you and I getting before God and making the pitch and being persuasive and convincing God to do things. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is God's method of accomplishing his purposes through us on the earth. Let, let, me, let me give you a little illustration of what I mean by that. We are, we are closing the circuit, you see. It, it, let me ask you, is God sovereign? Is he in control of everything? Yes. Is God, uh, is God omniscient? That means does he know everything? Does he know your need? Does he know your needs before you tell him your needs? Then why do you have to pray? Does God love you? Yeah, we love Well, if God loves you and he knows your need, why do you need to come to him and say, God, I have this need. Can you help me? Right? You ever wonder that? Could God do things without us praying? Is he capable of that? Of course he is. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. Is that his design to work apart from prayer? His best design is to work in conjunction with prayer. How does that work? Why does that work? What does it mean that the prayer that gets to heaven starts in heaven? My dad is a pastor. I grew up in a pastor's home. He pastored in South Dakota for 21 years. That's where I grew up. And he moved there. We moved there uh, when I was very young. He pastored a church in, in Oklahoma that ran about 300. And we moved to South Dakota. And he took a church that had 12 people. He thought, eh, 12 is a good enough number for Jesus? Is good enough for me. And so he went. And he pastored this church. And we met in a little renovated farmhouse. And this church began to grow. And we started to burst at the seams. And we prayed. And we felt God telling us, you need to build a building. You need to build a bigger worship space. And so in faith, we stepped out. We started a building program, and we, we raised some funds, and we got volunteer labor from other churches down south. They came up. We built a building on a little piece of property down the street that we purchased, and this church building came up, and it was great. And we praised the Lord for it, but we ran out of money. We didn't have enough to pave the parking lot. So we had gravel. Well, we were out of compliance with the city. The city had ordinances that said that kind of zoning requires a paved parking lot. So some time passed. We got a letter one day from the city. It said, since you are not in compliance with city ordinances, a warrant has been issued for the arrest of your pastor. <laughs> and you will be fined, and we will ask you to vacate your premises because you're out of compliance. Now, that's intimidating, right? That's a little intimidating. So what do we do? We prayed. We got together, had a prayer meeting. My dad said, okay, church, here's the deal. Uh, they want to arrest your pastor. <laughs> and uh, they're going to kick us off our property, and they're going to find us some money. So we need to pray that God will supply the funds to pave this parking lot. He shared that request with his best friend, who's a pastor in Texas. That best friend went to his church at their prayer meeting. He said, hey, folks, uh, as you pray, keep in mind my friend Rob Grimm. He's a pastor in South Dakota. Told him the problem. When he mentioned the parking lot, there's a couple on the back row that gasped. And they looked at each other. And their jaw was on the floor. Because months prior, God had impressed upon them in prayer that he wanted them to set money aside for the paving of a parking lot. 
Now, they assumed that this parking lot was going to be in behind their church in Texas. There was a space back there. They needed some additional parking. They thought, God wants us to save some money. We're going to set aside earmark it for a parking lot behind our church. When they heard their pastor tell them our need, they looked at each other. They said, there's our parking lot. <laughs> and they wrote a check, and they sent it to our church. And do you know that the exact amount that they had saved was precisely what it cost to pave our parking lot? Now, what a great prayer we prayed. No, no. What a great God we serve. Did our prayer make that happen by itself? Did God just suddenly become aware of our need because we prayed? Did he suddenly concoct a plan after we prayed? No, no. He was already working in heaven and behind the scenes to meet our need. And we simply ratified on the earth what God was already doing in the hearts of people in Texas to meet our need. And I want you to write this down. Prayer is an invitation to work with God. Prayer is an invitation. He was inviting our little church to uh, be involved in the process in faith, through faith. And he was involving this couple in this church in Texas to be involved in the process of meeting needs of another church. It's an amazing circle. Uh, did you know that God is saying to you, my child, I want you to help me run the universe. I want you to help me run the universe. God is saying, does that sound arrogant to think and believe? Yeah, well, if so, then the Apostle Paul was very arrogant. Because he says in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, we are co-laborers. We are working together with God. God invites us to be involved. Why? Does he need us? He doesn't need us. He wants us to share in his experience. You know, when I was a kid, I'd go and I'd visit my papa on his farm. I had a papa. Anybody got a papa in here? Everybody needs a papa. And he lived on this farm. He had a big spread in rural Missouri, right? And he had some back roads, some dirt roads. And I would ride with Papa. I was just a little kid. I'd ride with him in his pickup truck. And we'd go run errands. He'd go mend a fence. Or he'd go do this, check the mail, do that, go down to the chicken house. And I'd go with Papa on his truck. And every now and then, Papa would say, Scotty, you want to drive? And I'd say, yeah. And I'd climb up in Papa's lap. And I'd steer. I'd drive that truck sitting on... Now, you can't do that in Modesto. They'll arrest you. <laughs> you can do it in the sticks in Pineville, Missouri. Population, I don't even know. You blink, you miss it. But I was sitting on Papa's lap, and I'm driving. Now, his foot's on the gas. His hands are at the ready. If I put us in the ditch, he was right there. He's going to take over, right? Could I drive without him? Not a chance. Could he drive without me? Oh, yeah. He's in control the entire time, but he is allowing me to share in this experience. And through that, you know what? We bonded. We bonded, and that's what prayer does. God shares experiences of life with us through prayer, and we bond with him. We don't pray for other people to look at us and say, oh, how spiritual. <laughs> okay? Prayer is not for other people in that sense. Write this down. Prayer is not a display of self-righteousness. It's a means of discipleship. God disciples you through prayer. You remember that Pharisee Jesus pointed out in Luke? He, and this Pharisee, he's praying for all to hear, and all eyes are on him. He's like, Lord, make, thank you. I am not like this man over here. Was God listening to that prayer? No, he was listening to the prayer of the tax collector a little ways down who's praying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Prayer disciples us. Prayer molds us and we bond and we begin to unify our will with his because it's not about our will. It's about God's will. Write this down. Prayer is not manipulating God's will to fit our desires. It's finding God's will and joining him. Okay? It's not naming it and claiming it. I don't know what your church background is, but you, you, God does not grant every single request just because we think we can command the Holy Spirit to step to it, okay? You know, there's a little boy in his room. His mom caught him, and he's just praying furiously. He's just praying, Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo. And she goes, uh, son, what, what, are, what are you doing? Oh, I'm praying. You're praying for Tokyo? Yeah, I, I had a geography test at school, and I need God to make Tokyo the capital of France. 
If it's not in God's will, he doesn't grant it. We need to unify our will with his will. So it's from him. All things are from him. That's the origin of prayer. Now, secondly, we see that it's through him. It's through him. Okay? Everything is accomplished through God in your lives. Everything is accomplished through him. That's why we pray. So we know how things get done. It's not by the work of our hands. We pray so we know who gets the job done. It's God. In your notes, uh, fill in this blank. Effective prayer, if we've already seen that effective prayer is anchored in his purpose, now we see effective prayer relies on his power. It relies on his power. It's all through God. It has nothing to do with your power, with your ability, with your strength. It's all through God. Even prayer itself is through God. There are three things that God gives us that I want you to see. First of all, God gives us the desire to pray. Did you know that? God gives you the desire. Did you know that in your own nature you don't have the desire to pray? You don't. You are sluggish to pray. Your, your old nature, your sin nature, your flesh does not want to pray. That's not your first inclination. When trouble comes along, your instinct is to do it yourself. I'm going to fix this. Okay, I'm going to DIY this thing. Right? Or I'm going to call somebody. Hey, what do you think I ought to do about this? I'm, I'm in a jam here. Right? It's not your instinct to go to God. And that, sadly, that's how it is with churches. When churches stop growing, do we hit our knees and pray? No, oftentimes we have meetings to talk about, hey, let's, let's brainstorm. How can we grow our church? And God, through his spirit, gives us the desire to pray because naturally we don't have it. Romans 3.11 says no one understands, no one seeks for God. Romans 8.7 says that the mindset on the flesh is hostile. To God. Did you know your flesh is the enemy of God? That's how bad it is. You are the enemy of God in your old nature. But when God places his spirit in you, when you are born again, when you are saved, he places his spirit in you, and that is your new nature. And it is that new nature that gives you the desire to seek him. And to come to him with your problems. Romans 8.15 says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons to, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You know what Abba means in the Hebrew? It, it means daddy. It's a term of endearment from a little child to their daddy. I got a two-year-old. I get home. The first noise I hear is her scrambling through the house saying, Daddy! The other night in this room, it was about this packed out. We had a multi-church gathering, a prayer gathering on Thursday night for this Franklin Graham event that's coming to Turlock in May. Multi-church gathering on Thursday night last week. And one of the representatives from the Billy Graham Association was here. He was marvelous. And we prayed together. And he shared with us. He said, I'm a grandpa. He said, I got grandkids. And when I go see them, they come running toward me. And I get down like this. And they come and I scoop them up and they start talking. And I'm fascinated. I'm transfixed by everything they have to say. I want to hear all about it. I want to hear about that wobbly tooth. I want to hear about what they had at McDonald's. I want to hear about that cartoon they just saw. I want to hear it all. That's the kind of relationship that your God wants with you. He wants to hear about it. He wants to know what his child wants to tell him. But you need to want that. And so he places the desire in you for that. Not only that, God gives us the direction to pray. He gives us the direction to pray. Do we struggle knowing what to say in prayer sometimes? What to ask for? Sometimes it's hard to know what to ask for. Do we sometimes want things that we don't need? Is that a thing? Oh yeah, that's a thing. Does God always give us the things that we ask for that we don't need? Well, thank God he does not. If he did, a lot of us be married to other people, right? And some of you are going, hmm. <laughs> let, me, let me introduce you to our marriage and family pastor after the service today. Uh, listen, do you ever thank God for unanswered prayers? I sense a Garth Brooks song coming on. I do, man. When I was in college, I was a single guy, and I'm up there on Liberty Mountain, Lynchburg, Virginia, and all my friends are pretty much getting paired up. And I'm looking around going, all right, God, here we go. Bring the life. I'm ready, right? And a young lady would enter my life, and I go, is that her? Is that her? Nothing. 
right? Another one come along, I go, oh, that's her, right? Is that her? And another one would come along, I go, okay, God, now that's her, right? Tell me that's her. Is that her? <laughs> Nothing, right? Because God knew best. Because he knew you need to graduate in four years, and you're going to move to San Diego. And in San Diego, waiting for you is this young lady named Deanna Michelle Pollard. And she is the exact personality and temperament and height <laughs> that you need. So God is wise. So we, we want things that we don't need. Sometimes do we, do we need things we don't want? Of course we do. And that is true our entire life. My little kids, man, when they're acting up, I'll say to them, now we spank at our house, okay? Just, just to be very honest about it. We make no apologies for that. Thank you. Hey, hey. <laughs> Preaching on corporal punishment today. So I'll come to them when they're acting up, and I go, uh -huh. do you need a spanking? Now, can you guess what their answer is? Well, if it's my two-year-old, she grabs her butt, and she goes, no! <laughs> now, just because they don't want it, does that mean they don't need it? No. no, they probably need it. And sometimes God knows what we need, even if we don't want it. Sometimes we want things that we've already got. Does that ever happen? You ever pray one of these holy prayers, like, God, give me more so that I can give more to you. I just, I want to give you more. So God, if you would give me more, I could give more. To you. Oh, that sounds nice and spiritual, doesn't it? <laughs> Except maybe God wants you to check your bank account and reprioritize a little bit so you can give more of what you already have to him. Is that a thing? Might be a thing. Hey, sometimes we don't even know what we should pray for. We just flat out don't even know what our need is. We don't know what to pray for. We got nothing. You ever get there? What's the promise of Scripture in that regard? In Romans 8, it says that in that situation, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, in Romans 8, 26, with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of who? of God. Well, is that a beautiful picture of all things are from him and through him, through the Spirit, and to him. Amazing. But it's according to the will of God. Jesus prayed according to the will of God. Okay? He gives us the roadmap. John 5, 19. He says, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does that the son does likewise that's the roadmap jesus says i look into heaven and i see what god is up to and i ask for that we need to join god in what he is at work in i did a study once upon a time called uh, uh experiencing god henry blackaby and one of the things that he said in that study is look and see where god's at work and join him there no greater opportunity than in prayer for that to take place. And you need to get with God and you need to ask God, what should I pray for? When you don't know what to pray for, you ask him. And when he tells you, then he gives you, in your notes, he gives you the faith to pray. Because if you know it's of his will, you can have faith to ask for it. You can ask for it with total boldness, with total confidence, because you know this is what the Lord wants. And I'm going to ask in faith. Did you know that the things that God has for you are far greater than the things that you could ever conjure up on your own? And they're, they're God-sized things. And they take God-sized faith. And that's why we need a faith from him. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And the Greek word used for word there is the word rema, which is a spoken utterance. It's him speaking into your life. He can do that through the Bible. He can do that through your Christian brothers and sisters. He can do that effectively in prayer. And we get faith. John 15, 17 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you wish and it will be done for you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. If my word abides in you and you abide in me. James 1 6, let him ask in what? Faith. With no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Faith is essential for effective 
prayer. Are you asking in faith? I work for a missions organization that had a program uh, where our, our leader, Vernon Brewer, was told by God in prayer, Vernon, I want your organization to set about the task of building and planting a thousand church buildings in India. And I want, this is going to happen by the year 2000. Now, we had less than three years to get it done. And I was a part of this organization. And Vernon said, God, I, that's, that's a massive goal. That's going to take so much infrastructure. State. I, it's too big. I can't do it. God said, good, I can. And Vernon had faith. And he shared that vision with people. And every time he shared it, they'd laugh at him. And he shared it with a friend. And he said, every time I tell people about this vision, they laugh at me. And this friend very wisely said, Vernon, if they don't laugh, it's not big enough. And so we kept the faith and we believed and we plugged away and we raised money and we did all this. And do you know that the money for the 1,000th church came in on New Year's Eve 1999? You can have faith in a God-sized task that comes from Him. It's through Him. And finally, in your notes, it's to Him. Everything returns back to God in your notes. Everything returns back to God. We've seen how effective prayer is rooted, anchored in God's purpose. Effective prayer is accomplished in God's power. And now we see effective prayer focuses on his praise. What is the objective of prayer? What's the point? Well, what does our text say? It says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To what? To him be glory forever. That is the point of prayer. That is the point of human existence. God's in the business of getting glory to himself. And I would say that the reason our prayers seem ineffective is because we're more preoccupied with our own gratification than we are with the glory of God. And if we would enter into that with a mindset of God be glorified, I bet you'd start to see more prayers answered. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't want to hear what your needs are. He, he does. He absolutely does. But he wants us to be focused primarily on worshiping him. There's different components of prayer, you see. In James, we like to focus on the part in James 4, which says you do not have because you do not ask. And we hear that, we go, oh, hey, hot stuff, man. I don't have because I don't ask. Well, I'll start asking. Next verse says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. What is your primary motivation as you pray, ultimately it needs to be the Lord's glory. You see, there's, there's different components. There's petition when you pray. What's petition? It's when you ask for yourself. There's intercession. What's that? That's when you ask on behalf of other people. There's thanksgiving. That's when you show gratitude to God for what he has done. And then there's the most overlooked one, praise. And that's when you are lavishing love and worship upon God simply because of who he is. You're saying, God, you are good. You are great. You are glorious. There is none like you. You are so loving. You are so kind. God, I want you at the center of my life. And you are just worshiping him. Do you know you can enter into prayer with an attitude of getting? And you can make that petition and you can say amen and get out. And you could come back in an attitude of thanksgiving and you could say, thank you, Lord, for what you did. And you could say amen and you could get out. But if you come and your motivation is worship, you can linger and you can stay and stay and stay forever in that prayer because you can never worship God enough. You can never worship God enough. This is not contingent upon anything. Whether you have need, it's been filled, it's been unfulfilled, you have great need, you can express it to God. It doesn't matter whether those needs are inherent or fulfilled. You can worship the Lord no matter what. And that is his desire. And this is why we pray in the name of Jesus. You ever wonder that? Why do we close our prayer? And in Jesus' name, amen. Why do we do that? Well, some of us grew up that way, and that's just our, our mode of of. of of praying, right? But there's a reason. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why do we pray in the name of Jesus? It is in, it's dedicating the prayer in honor of God through Christ. Okay, well, I'm gonna go back to Liberty University in May because I'm finishing my master's. I'm gonna graduate. Looking forward to being back on my old campus. Gonna see all these buildings 
uh, that have popped up since I was a student there in the 90s. And they're all named after somebody. You got the Jerry Falwell Library. You got the LaHaye Ice Center. You got the Vines Arena. You got the Lake and Chapel. You got the Rawlings School of Divinity. Why have they got people's names on them? They're built in honor of people. And when you pray, you are dedicating that to the name of Jesus, to the glory of God. It's all from Him. It's all through Him. And it's all to Him. Sometimes we don't want to pray. Because we feel unworthy. You ever get there? God, I, I, I don't know what to say. God, I haven't been living like you want me to live. And, and I, I don't know why you would care to listen to anything I have to say because I know I've let you down. I haven't been all that you wanted me to be. God, there's no reason I should expect that you'll, you'll hear my prayer. You know what God says? He says, oh, whoa, wait a minute. You think that prayer is dependent on whether or not you've been good? Don't you know prayer depends on grace? It's my grace that answers prayer. And because of that, because grace and faith are so integral to prayer, I will say this, last point. You cannot pray effectively without having a personal relationship with Jesus. If you don't know him personally, if you have never invited him into your life, if he is not your Lord, if he is not your Savior, if you have not put your faith in Christ, he does not hear your prayers. The first effective prayer you will ever pray is that prayer of repentance to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Would you bow your head right now? Every eye is closed. If you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Scott, I want a more effective prayer life. And I recognize today that all things are from him and through him and to him. And I need to have his glory at the center of my mind when I pray. Lord, I want to recognize that power. And I want to embrace that because I want my prayer life to be radical. I want it to be effective. I want it to be, I want it to be ambitious for the kingdom and for the things of God. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up right now. Let me pray for you. Keep your head down, your eyes closed. Heavenly Father, I pray for these that have, have had this revelation today. Lord, would you bless their prayer life? Would you bring them to this place of great power, recognizing that all things are from you, through you, and unto you? God, be with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your head bowed for just a moment. Keep your eyes closed. If you are in here today, and you're saying, Pastor Scott, I recognize why my prayer life is ineffective. It's because I have never placed my faith in Jesus Christ. I have never invited him into my heart. I have never asked him to save me. And I am ready today to do that because I want to open the lines of communication with my God. If that's you, I would like you to pray right now where you are. Would you slip your hand up if that's you this morning? If you are making that decision for the very first time today, I'd just like you to, to just slip your hand up today. All right, just keep your hand up. I want to pray for you right now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for what you have done in this room, in the hearts of these, these people, God. Would you bless them? And, and I'm asking them right now to pray in their heart along these lines. Dear Jesus, I want to invite you into my life to be my Lord, to be my Savior. I am a sinner, and I need you to come into my life. I want to follow you, and I am trusting you for my salvation. And I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.